Today we're talking about Mashiach, which is this like fascinating Jewish idea that's intrigued the world all these centuries and millennia. And we have a lot of discussion about Mashiach, starting with the Tanakh, and then the Talmud, Midrash, the Zohar. There's so many things said about Mashiach. Who is he? What does he look like? Where is he from? Where is he born? When is he born? What's his name, maybe? And the details. How is he going to come? And the details don't always agree. So even like with the name of Mashiach, right? The Talmud has a famous passage, many different possibilities. It's this name and that name and this. So the details don't always agree. And all the different descriptions throughout our literature, it's not always clear exactly what Mashiach is like. But if you look carefully, you will find that there's five qualities, maybe more, but there's five that I've found that everybody agrees on. Five qualities of Mashiach that for sure are non-negotiable. Anybody who wants to be Mashiach has to have these five qualities, for sure. These are the five you have to have. And so it's a useful to know these five. It's useful. It's kind of like a, it's a good checklist that if somebody claims to be the Messiah or people claim that a certain person is the Messiah, whether past or present or in the future, you just kind of pull out this checklist and you see, does this person have these five qualities? Because for sure all the sources agree that Mashiach must have these five qualities. So if the person has these five qualities, okay, great, then it's possible. Let's see. You, you can explore further. But if the person is missing at least one of these qualities, then you know that they are immediately disqualified. And what you'll find is throughout Jewish history, many have claimed to be Mashiach. Many. Five major ones. Yeah, so I, there's been five major figures in Jewish history that either claimed themselves or were claimed by others to be Mashiach, many minor ones. The distinction I make between major and minor is if their movement outlasted their life, meaning like if it continued past their death. Yeah, so you have many minor Messianic figures who maybe generated some small movement, but their movement died with them or didn't last long afterwards. And then you have the major <laughs> figures who built something bigger, bigger than themselves, and also Judaism had to respond to their movements, and Judaism was permanently impacted by these movements. So the first one Jesus was Jesus. <laughs> no, the, for, let's, historically, the first one was Jesus 2,000 years ago. Now, about a century after Jesus, you had the next major figure, who was Bar Kochva, right? Shimon Bar Kochva, but who he, led... But he didn't claim to be the master. Sure, Rabbi Akiva declared him to be. Yeah, we don't know if he, again, we don't know what he himself said. We know that Rabbi Akiva for sure declared him to be the Messiah. And that's, that's a big deal. If Rabbi Akiva, the chief rabbi of the world, says that he's the Messiah, that's a really big deal. Of course, even in his day, people, when Rabbi Akiva declared Bar Kuchva to be the Messiah, they said, what are you talking about? One of the rabbis responded and told him famously that Rabbi Akiva... You know, grass will be growing out of your cheeks and the Messiah will still not have come, right? Meaning you'll be long gone and still Mashiach will not be here. So it, it, that's one of the people, one of the rabbis in his day that responded to him. But anyway, Rabbi Akiva declared Bar Kochva to be the Messiah because he really did do something major. He, he managed to expel the Romans. He managed to start rebuilding the temple even. There's a th we know for sure that he cleared the Temple Mount and they, he started rebuilding the temple. In fact, there's a theory among historians that originally Lag Omer, the holiday of Lag Omer, was originally instituted by Bar Kochva to commemorate the expulsion of the Romans and the start of rebuilding the temple. It's a very interesting theory. And of course, um, Rashbi, Shimon Bar Yochai, who Today we celebrate Lagba Omer, we celebrate Rashbi. Rashbi lived in that generation, right? Rashbi was one of the students of Rabbi Akiva. He was a contemporary of Bar Kochba. And then Lagba Omer became associated with him. But there is this theory that it may have even started a little bit earlier with um, Bar Kochba, who actually on that day started rebuilding the Third Temple. It's a theory. I'm not saying that it's a fact, but there is some evidence to support it. Eventually the Romans came back and put down their, their revolt. Bar Kochva revolt. And again, it had a, a very serious impact on Judaism, even in halachically, like the fourth bracha of Birkat Amazon was instituted in response to, if you remember, the battle of Beitar. And Beitar was one of the main battles of the Bar Kochva rebellion. So it had an impact on even how we recite Birkat Amazon. And, and that's, so that's what I mean, that these are major Jewish figures because what they did had a serious and permanent impact on the development of Judaism 
going forward. So we had Jesus, and then a century later, Bar Kokhba. And then for a long time, you don't have any major figures. You have a lot of minor ones. Nehemiah ben Hushiel was one. Uh, Avram Abu Lafia was one. David Rubeni, Shlomo Molho. These were all kind of minor. There was one in Yemen. There was in Yemen, there was a couple. So yeah, so for a long time, there was no major figure. And then, who's next? In the 1600s? Shabbat Yeah, so in the 1600s, then you have the notorious Shabbat Tzvi. Shabbat Tzvi, again, was a major, major figure, managed to convince many, many Jews that he was the Messiah. Of course, eventually the Ottoman emperor, the Sultan, called him in and said, oh, you think you're Messiah? Okay, like, you're going to convert to Islam or we're going to execute you. So, of course, he sold out. He converted to Islam. And his closest followers converted with him. He convinced them that he was doing a tikkun for Islam by converting, and that he will rectify the, the Muslim world like that. Um, but ultimately, everybody realized that he was a faker. Or the vast majority of the Jewish world realized that he was a, another failed or false or failed messiah. And that was the end of it. Although, to this day, there's many conspiracy theories of like secret Shabbatean influence in the world. I will put all those aside. Generally speaking, I mean, the Shabbatai Tzvi movement was pretty much dead. And then the next major figure was, again, about a century after, who was Jacob Frank in the 1700s, who saw himself as basically like a second coming of Shabbatai Tzvi. Where, where is he from? Poland. Poland. Yes, yeah, so this was in Europe. And he came from a family of Shabbateans, and he saw himself as kind of like an, a second coming, and uh, started this new neo shabbatean Frankist movement, which uh, made a splash for a little while. And then with him as well, similar story, he ended up converting to Christianity with his father, Jacob Frank. So we had Jesus, we had uh, Shimon Bar Kochva, we had Shabtai Tzvi, Jacob Frank, and then finally, Lehavdil many, many times. You can't really say Lehavdil enough times, but in our day and age, the, the, the biggest messianic movement in the Jewish world is the Lubavitcher Rebbe, right? Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Uh, that's arguable. Um, yeah. Right, so he, he's a... Yeah, first of all, first of all, there's no doubt that he is one of the greatest rabbis, not only of the last century, but of all time, first of all. Uh, what he did was incomparable, revolutionary. revolutionary. He did for sure more than anybody to advance the messianic age, to rectify the world. You have to understand his vision and his genius. You know, he didn't just talk the talk, he walked the walk. If you think about even something like this whole vision of having Chabad houses, on like every corner of the planet and every country in the most remotest villages and jungles, wherever. You know, on the, the, the shut understanding of that, like on a simple level, why did he want to do this? Because, you know, to offer Jews wherever they might be, kosher, serv- you know, Jewish services, so that wherever a Jew might be anywhere in the world, there's access to a synagogue, to prayers, to kosher food, to a Jewish community, to Shabbat, and so on. That's a simple meaning, the simple reason that he wanted to do this, which is already incredible. But if you understand the Kabbalistic reason of what he was trying to accomplish, it was more than that. It was about absolute tikkun. Like this is the, the, the real tikkun olam. We talked about this recently with reciting brachas. We talked about the last time about brachot and how re- we recite brachas on everything to rectify, to free the sparks. Right? There's sparks of holiness trapped everywhere on the planet within material things. They are covered in these klipot of these physical husks. And our job is to free the spiritual sparks within. And that's, that's something that, like going back to the Arizal and to the Zohar and to the Arizal, that our purpose on a mystical level is to go all over the world and to free those sparks and thereby rectify the whole cosmos spiritually. And that's how we bring about the Messianic Age. Um, and the Lubavitcher we took that into overdrive and literally sent people everywhere on the planet on a Kabbalistic level to rectify, to free the sparks wherever they might be, in the jungles of Southeast Asia or wherever, in deserts, in Africa, in South America, everywhere, to rectify the world, to make sure that all the sparks, wherever they might be, will be liberated and freed through mitzvot and prayers and brachot and good deeds and all these things that we're all supposed to do. So it was nothing less than actually rectifying the entire planet and preparing it spiritually for the coming of Mashiach and for the Messianic age, which is incredible. Because again, he didn't just say that he would do it. He, he was able to accomplish it. He was able to inspire people to do that. So that's an incredible, incredible and achievement and genius. That's right. That's right. And so it's understandable why there's such a huge Messianic movement 
around him, despite the fact that it's been almost three decades since he passed away. So he, there's no doubt that he's a great figure. I personally have a portrait of him in my office as well. However, the question of being Mashiach, that's a separate topic that needs to be discussed. And so as I was saying, that the, every, a person who claims to be Mashiach or who, whoever will be Mashiach needs to have these five qualities. That's just basic, fundamental, based on all of our sources. And so we have to see if any of these five people from the past had these qualities, all five of these qualities, and anybody who claims in the future to be the Messiah or in the present or in the future, do they actually have these five qualities? important qualities. So I want to share those five with you and explain them and why they are important and where they come from and then go from there. So before that, just quickly to review the actual alachot of Mashiach as brought down by the Rambam, Maimonides, Moshe ben Maimon, who was also considered, um, you know, we say that from mi Moshe ad Moshe, lo kam od ke Moshe, that from the time of Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, until Moses Maimonides, there never arose one like Moses. He's considered, you know, he's the great codifier of Jewish law. And so we will hopefully, in about a month, devote, when his yard site comes, devote some time just to the Rambam, because he's such an important, monumental figure. So in the Mishnah Torah and in his code of Jewish law, he actually outlines the Alachot Ilchot Melachim, the Alachot of Kings, and specifically the Alachot of Mashiach in chapter 11. So this is just to understand, how do we know for sure when somebody is Mashiach? What is the job of Mashiach? So this is what he says. Right from the beginning. Number one, that the Messiah is really just a Jewish king. His job, number one, is to reestablish the Davidic dynasty. That's God's chosen dynasty, like it says clearly in the Tanakh. It's the only legitimate line of kings is the line of King David. And the job of the Messiah is, number one, to reestablish the Davidic dynasty, the Jewish kingdom, the throne in Jerusalem. Number one. And then he has to rebuild the temple. Ubonea Mikdash. He has to rebuild the temple. So we await the third temple. The next job of Mashiach is to rebuild the temple. Number two. Maybe there is one idea that the third temple will descend from heaven, but that's, that's not, the Rambam didn't hold by that kind of Midrash. The simple idea is, on the simplest level, Mashiach has to just physically start the project of rebuilding the temple. And number three is and to gather, to end the exile of the Jewish people and to bring the Jews back to Israel. So these are the three, the three jobs of Mashiach. And then the Rambam makes sure that you know do not think that Mashiach has to be some miracle worker. That is not important. That is not a requirement. There's no need for Mashiach to work miracles. And the Rambam makes it very clear that he doesn't even have to be Mechayem Etim. He does not have to resurrect the dead. That's not a sign that a person is the Messiah. That's not important. Those are not the important things. The important things are that the Messiah reestablishes the kingdom of Israel. The Davidic dynasty rebuilds the temple, brings the Jews back to Israel. He does not have to be a miracle worker. He does not have to revive the dead. You know, there's an old Hasidic saying, that what's the big deal in reviving the dead, right? Anybody can revive the dead. It says any, any second-rate rabbi can revive the dead. The Hasidic saying goes that a real rabbi knows how to revive the living, right? That's, that's what's challenging. Reviving the dead is easy. You have to know how to revive the living. So Mashiach is not somebody who can revive the dead. It's somebody who can revive the living. That's the idea. You don't have to be a miracle worker. A miracle worker. That's not the requirement. Okay. Now, what is important, the Rambam continues, that how do we know if somebody is Mashiach? So, im ya'amod melech mi beit David, if you have a king, somebody who is a king, and who can prove that he's from the line of David, and this person is hogeba Torah, he's constantly meditating upon the Torah, ve'osek b'mitzvot, and is full of engaging in mitzvot and fulfilling the mitzvahs, ke'david aviv, like King David, his forefather which needs its own explanation. What does it mean to keep the Torah like King David? But of course, Mashiach is a, is a direct descendant of King David. In some ways, he is King David. It's like the but return King of, King David. of King David. That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's hard to be able to prove your lineage. But the truth is that, and we'll talk more about this later, like probably every Jew has some direct line, unless there's converts, I guess. But most Jews... Are probably have a direct connection to King David in some way, simply because King David lived so long ago, and he had many kids, 
you know, the Talmud in one place says that he had like at least 400 kids. Wow. So if you can, and then King Solomon, King David had 400 kids? at least, wow. and then King yeah, Solomon, yeah. and then his son, King Solomon, had a thousand wives. The Tanakh says that clearly. So imagine how many kids King Solomon had. So imagine how many descendants of King David there must be. And that was 3,000 years ago. So imagine over 3,000 years of people how, how marrying. Many, how many believers are descendants of King David? Exactly. So there's some millions and millions of people in the world after 3,000 years would be descended from King David. So that's not really, that's probably not the hardest thing to find because uh, I bet many Jews are actually in some way connected to King David after all these years. Um, but, but Mashiach really is David. Like he is, the, King David is the prototype of Mashiach. And as we'll see in the five qualities that we discuss, these are qualities that, Mashi- that, that David had. Mashiach has the qualities that King David had. And he, the, the Rambam continues that Mashiach, of course, has to know all the Torah Shebechtav and Shebe'al Peh, that he has to follow the whole written and oral Torah. And Ve'yachov kol Yisrael aleilech ba, and he will encourage and inspire all of the Jewish people to return to proper Torah observance. And the next thing is really important, Ve'yilachem milchamot Hashem, and he'll fight the wars of God. As we know, we talked about Gog and Magog and all these prophesied wars that will happen at the end of days. And Mashiach is not just somebody who is, you know, a, a great scholar, but he also fights the wars of God. So what, is he, he's a warrior? He's also a warrior. So a person who does these things, so the Rambam says that a person who does these things is the presumptive Messiah. We're still not sure if he's for sure the Mashiach, but he is the presumptive Messiah. Until if he does, if he does all these things and succeeds, and he builds the temple in its right place in Jerusalem. And he gathered all the people of Israel, all the Jews to Israel. Then you know, the only time where you're certain that a person is the Messiah is if these things have been accomplished. He defeated the enemies of Israel, reestablished the dynasty, rebuilt the temple, brought all the Jews back to Israel. So how do you know if a person is Bevadai Mashiach? We are only certain if he did all these things, rebuilt the temple, brought all the Jews back to Israel, fought all the wars, reestablished the Davidic dynasty. If a person succeeded in doing this, then you know that he is Bevadai Mashiach. And until then, you know, it would be very premature to declare anybody Mashiach if they have not fulfilled these things. And that's how we only then will we know for sure that a person is Messiah. And if, if they seem to be heading in that direction, like somebody like Bar Kokhva, Bar Kokhva did defeat the Romans. He fought the wars of God. He started rebuilding the temple. He was apparently a great scholar, perhaps one of the students of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva did declare him to be the Messiah. So that he was the presumptive Messiah because he seemed to be fulfilling all the roles. But once he died, and the Rambam explains this, once he he's dead, and he did not fulfill all these goals, then you know for sure that the person is not Mashiach. Yeah. But there's a, there could be a Mashiach in every generation. Yeah, so we have an idea that in every generation, there is somebody who has the potential to be the Messiah, right? God keeps a, at least one or perhaps more in every generation people who are potential Messiahs. And if the generation merits it and the time is right, then God will call on that person. Okay, so why do you say if he dies, then he's not supposed to die? No, because he's supposed to reestablish the Davidic dynasty no, and no. rule as king. Eventually he will die. After 40 years, according to some sources, uh, like king, just like King David ruled for 40 oh, years, yeah. King Solomon ruled for 40 years. That yeah, seems to be the ruled. standard term. Moses was the leader of Israel for 40 years. So the standard term is one generation, is defined as 40 years. So after Mashiach fulfills these goals, he still needs to rule for 40 years and then pass away. Okay, but I, thought, I thought then once Mashiach comes, I mean, he stays the life. <coughs> eventually, yes. So eventually also there will be a resurrection of the dead. That's true. After a certain period of time. It doesn't have to be right away, though. At okay, some point in the future. But the Mashiach Ben Yosef thing complicates things a little bit now, too. Because, right. Because now, because now that you can meet a whole new criteria now. I want to keep it simple, and I want to avoid the discussion of Mashiach ben Yosef versus Mashiach ben David, because truly there is also a discussion of whether there are really two messiahs or not. Is it really one messiah in just two phases? Um, Or is it two distinct individuals? So that needs its own discussion. But the the simple, I'm going to keep it as pshat as possible, that there's one Mashiach. Maybe another day we'll discuss... 
uh, various other possibilities, but assuming that there's only one. And it's important to remember that there's no need for a second, co second coming, because we're saying here, the Rambam says very clearly, that a person's only Mashiach when they fulfilled these roles. If they have not fulfilled these tasks, they are not the Messiah. And all these other groups that have claimed somebody as the Messiah, they had to deal with this problem. Because if you're saying, let's say Jesus is the Messiah or Bar Kokhba or whoever, or Shabtai Tzvi, but they clearly did not fulfill these basic tasks. So what do the people have to say? Oh, well, he'll come back, right? The Shabbatean said, well, Shabtai Tzvi will come back because he clearly did not fulfill any of these tasks. So that means he must come back in the future. And of course, 400 years later, he's never come back. Same thing with Jesus. 2,000 years ago, the original disciples of Jesus were expecting him to fulfill these tasks, and he didn't. So they said, well, he will come back to fulfill these roles, and they were expecting him to return yeah, imminently. Maybe they think he's going to be resurrected. That's, that, that's, that's right. right. I mean, reincarnation. Whatever it is, whatever it is, they have to claim a second coming, because clearly the person did not fulfill those tasks. Clearly today, so in real time, this has not been done. There is no third temple. There is no Davidic dynasty. The majority of Jews are not living in Israel in a proper holy Torah kingdom. So clearly none of these things have been fulfilled, which means simply the Messiah has not yet come. That's kind of obvious. So how do these people continue to believe in a Messiah when it's so obvious that a Messiah has not come? Well, they say that, well, he came, he, did, he started the work, but didn't actually get very far, but he will come back. And so Christians have been waiting for 2,000 years for him to come back. And Shabbatans were waiting for a long time for him to come back. And so on. everybody's always waiting. And again, Lehavdil, a lot of Chabadnikim who thinks that the Rebbe is Mashiach are waiting for him to come back, even it's, though it's been so long. So having said all that, what kind of person should we expect Mashiach to be? What are those five qualities that Mashiach must have? Number one, the first quality is the most obvious and needs the least explanation, is that this is a person who's, of course, a Talmid Chacham who obviously knows Torah Sheba Khtav, Torah Sheba Al Peh, he knows Torah inside and out, and doesn't just know it, but can teach it, and can spread it and inspire people. So he's like a genuine Torah teacher who's a very inspirational figure and an authentic, real scholar. And we talked about last time that just plain Chokhmah is not enough. To be a computer is not enough. What do I mean? A computer can also, a hard drive can also store all the thousands of texts and all the whole Talmud, and everything can recall it instantly. So it's not enough for a person to just, you know, be blessed with a photographic memory and to just have all of Shas in their head and to be able to recall it instantly. That's nice. It's a nice feature, but uh, the Mashiach does not need to be a computer. He needs to be somebody who understands, who has Bina and Da'at, right? It's not enough to just have the plain Chokhmah and to just be able to memorize a great deal of information. It also requires a much deeper level of understanding and being able to relate to it and synthesize and apply it and, and actually have that wisdom and to inspire people and to be able to relay that information to others properly and honestly and truthfully and so on. So that's quality number one. Number two, though, and this is the, the one where a lot of people who claim to be Mashiach or claim to be, this is where a lot will fail. Because as we saw, as the Rambam said, he has to fight Milchamot Hashem. He has to be a warrior. He's a warrior Messiah. And in the Tanakh, Mashiach is described as a warrior Mashiach. And it connects to our Parsha this week and to the whole story of Yaakov and Esav and Israel. What is this whole, if you think about what is this whole story about Yaakov and the transformation of Yaakov from Yaakov to Israel? Think about that. Yaakov is born, and the Torah tells us that he's a, a, a tam person. Tam, he's an innocent guy. Yoshevo Alim, that he sits in tents all day, and he just wants to, like, learn and pray and meditate. And his twin brother, Esav, is a man of the field. He's an ish sadeh, ish tzai, that he's, he's hunting. He's a man of the field. He's tough. He was born physically strong, muscular, hairy. Right? So they're twins. And yet Yaakov is this, like, soft soft-spoken, soft guy, sitting in tents, just wants to be left alone, just wants to read his books, read, pray, meditate. And Esav is the exact opposite. He's this hunter, this warrior, this great, strong figure. What was the point of that? Originally, they were meant to serve God together. Right? Esav was given the 
these qualities to be physically strong and to rectify the world physically. And Yaakov was given the ability to rectify the world spiritually. Yaakov would be the teacher, the person who does mitzvot and all these things. And Esau would be the person who has to fight. Somebody has to defeat evil too. Somebody has to build. Somebody has to do those physical things. So Esau would have been the physical builder, the fighter, somebody who confronts the darkness. And Yaakov is the person who's spiritually, who's educating, who's spreading the light. They were supposed to work together. But Asa failed in that time. He couldn't really channel that physical strength in the right direction. And then what Yaakov did is he said, okay, if you're not going to do this mission, I will do it. And he took the birthright from him. He took his, he, Yaakov took Asaph's birthright, which means, what does that mean that he took his birthright? It means he took his mission. He took his actual purpose upon himself. And he took his blessing too. And he made sure that he, Yaakov is basically saying, I will be Asaph also. And that what henceforth, what God does is, is he tells Yaakov, prove it. And for the next 20 plus years, he makes Yaakov even more, really, really for the rest of his life. He makes Yaakov work to prove that he can be Esav. So what do you see Yaakov doing henceforth? He works for Lavan. He's shepherding. God. He makes Yaakov work hard. Be a shepherd. Work for Lavan. Do this. Do that. Build this whole enterprise with these sheep and the goats and everything. And then he makes him fight. He battles Lavan. The Torah says that Yaakov wrestled with Lavan. And then he wrestles with the angel. He wrestles with people. He wrestles with divine beings. And finally, when he proves that, yes, he can fight, that he's not just going to run away. Originally, what was he doing? He was always running away. Asaph said he's going to hunt him down. What does Yaakov do? Instead of confronting him, he runs away from him. Yaakov starts by running away, and then he learns that he can't run away from his problems anymore. He even runs away from Lavan at one point, and then he realizes that he can't keep running away. And finally, he confronts Lavan and wrestles with him and defeats him. And then he wrestles with the angel, and then he confronts Esav, and he learns to fight. He learns to become a warrior, not just somebody who is Yoshevo Alim, who sits in tents, but somebody who can also fight and prove his physical might. This is the true Israel. This is when God renames him Israel. This is the person that the Jew is supposed to be, not just a scholar who is Yosheva Alim, but also somebody who's an Ish Sadeh, somebody who can be a man of the field and can fight. And this was actually perfectly <coughs> embodied in King David. This is why King David is so special. Why was King David unique? Why was King David God's beloved? David means beloved. His very name means that he's God's beloved. Why did God choose him and say that he is the forefather of Mashiach, and he's the only one. His line is the only legitimate line of kings. What's so special about David? David is that Yaakov and Esav in one person. He is the perfect Israel. And what's even crazier, this is really going to blow your mind. There's only two people in the whole Tanakh that the Tanakh calls them Admoni. Esav was Admoni, and King David was Admoni. That's not a stam connection. That's not a coincidence, right? Remember, is but there's no coincidence. Physical? Is it a physical characteristic? Yeah, King yeah, David was, was described as Admoni as well. He was a redhead and he fought with blood. Like so King blood. David is described like Asaph, physically like Asaph. He was this incredible warrior that could defeat, that, that defeated 200 Philistines single-handedly in one battle. Right? His father-in-law, Shaul, put him to the test, said, bring me 100 Philistine. I won't say what he asked him to bring, but he wanted him to fight 100 Philistines and King David fought 200. And he was a warrior, and he was this incredible scholar, and this composer, and this musician. He wrote Tehillim, and he wrote all these beautiful psalms, and, and you read Tehillim, and you see how close he was to God, how he was constantly, you know, put God before him and everything. So he is that perfect embodiment of Israel. He is the Yaakov and Esav in one. He is spiritually Yaakov and physically Esav. The Tanakh describes him physically like Esav. He's the only other person who's called Admoni, like Esav. So the connection's made very clear in the Tanakh. That's King David. And that's Mashiach. And by the way, really, all of our great figures were warriors. Avraham was a warrior. He fought the kings. You remember, he went up against these kings. He, he took them on. He fought them in battle. Uh, Yehoshua, Shimshon, even Moses. Moshe Rabbeinu, we mentioned that recently, that he fought Og. He went head to head and he fought the giant Og. And he was the one that single-handedly defeated this giant in battle. So even Moses went to fight. So all of our great heroes were warriors. So that's where a lot of the um, people in the past didn't really fulfill this role. Somebody like Jesus 
was is considered described like a pacifist, you know, turn the other cheek and all that. Was not was not really a, a fighter, not in his generation. Again, if they'll argue, well, he'll come back to fight those in the second coming. But like we said, we can't wait for a second coming. Bal Kuchva, though, he physically fought. He like literally fought off the Romans and defeated them in battle miraculously. Took on the biggest empire in the world and was able to defeat them, at least temporarily. So he's the only one that really fulfilled this particular requirement. Somebody like Shabtai Tzvi never fought. Jacob Frank never fought. And now, to answer your question, when you look at somebody like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe obviously knew this requirement. And what you find, and this has been pointed out he by was, others. He was a war strategist, actually. That's right. Not only was the Lubavitcher Rebbe consulted uh, by the IDF regularly, he, he often gave advice to IDF generals and Israeli prime ministers. That's very well known. He met with many prime ministers, with many generals, with many people in Israeli intelligence and so on. He did not advise them in military strategy. They often didn't listen to him, but he gave the right calls. That's one thing where he was in some ways a military strategist and did consult with the IDF. But it's more than that. The way that the Rebbe built Chabad is with a lot of military language and symbolism. Hashem. Right. So like, for example, the youth movement of Chabad is called Tzivot Hashem, right? Tzivot Hashem, the, the armies of God. And they give them like military ranks even. And the Lubavitch Rebbe instituted having a parade every year, like a military style parade on Lagba Omer, right? Specifically on Lagba Omer, which really, if you ask the historians, may be first done by Bar Kochva, right? Uh, so he instituted a military parade. His campaigns, right? the Rebbe instituted 10 campaigns. In English, the word campaign doesn't really necessarily mean something military, but the Hebrew word for them, the Mifzaim, Mifzaim, they are military campaigns. Right? You know the 10 campaigns of the Rebbe? He wanted to encourage Jews. He, the, he, he told his Chabad Shlichim to go and inspire others to do these 10 main things. Like putting on tefillin on people. You know how the Chabadnikim stand on street corners and ask, hey, are you Jewish? Let's put on tefillin. That's one of the campaigns. And the ladies go and ask to other women if they lit Shabbat candles. And so he did 10 such campaigns where he told his shlichim, his, the Chabadnikim, to go out and reach out to people to fulfill these 10 big mitzvahs. And they're called, he called them mifzaim, like military campaigns. So he used a lot of military language, a lot of military symbolism in his organization, in his style. And some people say it was done deliberately to fulfill this need of being a warrior messiah. But he was not a physical warrior, it was being a spiritual warrior. A mitzvah warrior, spiritual. So is that enough though? Because the implication of the Tanakh and of the Rambam and of all the original sources is that Mashiach is really a physical fighter. Like King David fought physically. And we do expect a physical Gogu Magog conflict. So we expect Mashiach to fight in that conflict uh, to lead in his troops essentially in battle. Yeah, he does. Now, one of the people who fulfilled so far all these qualities and was a warrior, and was a great Talmud Chacham, and should have been Mashiach. It says in the Talmud in Masechet Sanhedrin, he should have been Mashiach, but he wasn't, because he was missing quality number three. That's King Hezekiah, Chizkiyahu. King Hezekiah should have been the Messiah. The Talmud says that God wanted to make him Mashiach, and the angel said no, because he was missing one important quality. What was it missing? Music. Music. That's what the Talmud says. Uh, hmm? He was a musician. Mashiach has to be a musician. King David was a musician. He played the harp and the lyre and so on and wrote all these songs. And the Talmud says in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 94, first of all, it says, all the prophecies of Isaiah, which Christians use to support, to describe Jesus, but who was Isaiah actually talking about? 27 Hundred, roughly 28, 2700 years ago, who was he actually talking about? Isaiah. Isaiah was talking about Hezekiah. Isaiah was the prophet, the leading prophet, the court prophet in the time of King Hezekiah and his father, King Ahaz. And his prophecies if on the pshat level, on the simple understanding, King uh, or Isaiah the prophet was actually talking about Hezekiah. Chizkiyahu. And Chizkiyahu fulfilled us. So the Talmud says that Chizkiyahu fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah. Christians say, no, Isaiah was talking about Jesus. The truth is, 
Like around 27, roughly 100 years ago. I mean, there is a little discrepancy between secular dating and uh, Jewish traditional dating, but let's say roughly 2,700 years ago. King Hezekiah was one of the descendants of King David. He was one of the kings of Yehuda, the kings of Judah. And he was extremely righteous. And in his day, the Torah was learned and he was le- uh, very learned himself. And actually, he, he ended up marrying. He was an in-law of Isaiah eventually. And he was his great leader. And he stood up to, he fought wars. He stood up to Sancheriv, if you remember, uh, this Assyrian king who destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. And God made a miracle, and Sancheriv was unable to defeat. Yeah, he didn't lift a finger. He didn't have to. Right. But in this particular conflict. Right, right. But he was a military king as well. In that particular battle with Sancheriv, he didn't have, God made a miracle for him. And we actually have historical evidence for it. Uh, we have found the pillars that were inscribed by the king, by Sancheriv, that talk about this, actually. And that he, he doesn't admit that he couldn't take Jerusalem. But he says that he had Hezekiah holed up in Jerusalem. That's how he describes it in his own victory tablets, Sancheriv. So we do have archaeological evidence for this. In Isaiah, there's a place where the word, where there's a word that has a mem sofit in the middle of the word. Le marbe with a mem sofit in the middle of the word, which doesn't make sense. Why would, why would it say that? So the Talmud says that it's actually referring to Hezekiah and how he was supposed to be Mashiach. And God wanted to make him Mashiach. And Amram Midat Adin, Lifnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that the angels kind of, that symbolized the, the strictness of God. They said, Ribono Shalolam, Master of the Universe. King David, David Melech Yisrael, Shamar Kama Shirot V'tishbechot Lefanecha. He said so many songs. He composed so many songs for you. And you, Lo Asito Mashiach. You didn't make him Mashiach. And now... Hezekiah, she'asita lo kol anisim alalu, you did all these miracles for him, and yeah, he might be a great guy, velo amar shira lefanecha, but he didn't even sing one song for you. Now you're going to make him taseu mashiach. And so God said, okay. God was almost like overruled that Hezekiah was not made the Messiah because he was missing this critical feature, which is to be a musician. First of all, why is music so important? We see, for example, the prophets in, in the Tanakh, they needed music to enter a state of prophecy. Music is something very spiritual. It can actually put you into a trance and elevate you really highly spiritually. We see, for example, the prophet Elisha, who was one of the greatest in Melachim. He says, he, when he wanted to get into a prophetic state, he said, That God's, the spirit of God only came upon him when the music was playing. He needed music to get into a trance. In fact, there's one place that suggests what was the difference between Moses and all the other prophets. We know that Moses' prophecy was unique. Moses was the greatest prophet. He was different than all the other prophets. According to one explanation, how was he different? What made him different? Moses was the only prophet that didn't need music to prophesy. That all the other prophets actually needed some kind of music to get into a prophetic trance. And Moses did not. Right? He was fully aware, he was fully conscious, and he did not need music. That's according to one opinion. But music in general is something very spiritual. It can uplift the soul. It can get a person into a very deep prophetic state. And King David used music to get into that kind of state. And what, what instruments might Mashiach play? If you think about, if we want to be more specific. So King David, he played two instruments. The harp and the lyre, which is like a little harp, a lyre. Okay, Nevel. Right? He mentions that many times in Tehilim. Also, also, also Shminit. <laughs> yeah. Did he play all those instruments? It's possible. We know for sure from the... Could be. From the actual... Remember, King David's career in the Tanakh begins as the musician for King Saul. Talmud says that he had over his bed, right, a harp. That the, when the night wind, when the midnight breeze would blow, it would be like his alarm clock. I'll tell you one very beautiful gematria, for what it's worth. If you look at Navel and Chino, these two instruments, do the gematria of Navel. Nun is 50, Bet is 2, Lamed is 30, 82. And Chino, if you add them up, it's 358. 300, Navel and Chino is 358, which is the gematria of Mashiach. So Mashiach's instruments are the navel and the chino, the harp and the lyre. The harp is bigger, the lyre is more of a, a portable string instrument. The question is, what is a navel and chino today? 
because nobody really today plays the harp and the lyre. Maybe there's a handful of, of musicians that play these antique instruments in the world, but these are not common. So if we were to ask, well, what is a modern day harp? How did the harp evolve historically? The harp was eventually, it got so big that they laid it down, you know, by the Middle Ages, they laid it down horizontally. And then they made, they made a harpsichord. And then after the harpsichord, they wanted to be able to regulate the sound better. So they added hammers. And that was really the birth of the piano, right? If you look at a grand piano, it still has the shape of a harp, right? It's a harp lying on its side. So the harp became the harpsichord, which became the piano. And so the modern day harp would be a piano. And what is the lyre? The lyre is a small portable string instrument. In the book of Daniel, Daniel lists in chapter 3 various instruments that the king Nebuchadnezzar, that his uh, choir or whatever, that his, his band used. And it lists a whole bunch of instruments. And one of them is called the kitaras. Kitaras is the origin of the guitar. Yeah, the guitar started off as, as a, it's like a portable string instrument, right? So uh, perhaps the lyre and the harp are the piano and the guitar, which are really the two most common instruments, musical instruments today. That's how they evolved historically. So that's music. So that's the third quality of, of Mashiach is to be a musician. Remember, God wanted to make, bless you, God wanted to make Hezekiah the Mashiach and the angel said, no, 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 no. He's not a musician. End of discussion. Right? If he's not a musician, he can't be Mashiach. So say it was a harp turned into the what? The harp became the harpsichord, which is the piano. Yeah. And the lyre really became the guitar. So that's quality number three. And then quality number four is a really big one. And it's a big one, and you'll find something really incredible with this one. And it seems so simple. Quality number four is that Mashiach has to be a family person, a family man, that he has to be married, and he has to have children. Okay, we know that the Zohar talks about it in several places where it says about Mashiach that Mashiach and his wife, uh, they are a person has to come. It says, the world will continue, Kayama Alma Ad de Titi, until will come, Itata ke Gavna de Chava, a woman like Eve. And a man like Adam, they will outsmart the serpent. If you remember, we mentioned before that the Nachash, the serpent, was the force that took us out of Eden, and Mashiach is supposed to bring us back to Eden, and the gematria of Nachash is 358, just like Mashiach is 358. And the Zohar says that it's going to take a man like Adam and a woman like Eve to do the tikkun for Eden and to outsmart and to reverse what was done in Eden. So Mashiach's wife, we're talking about the man Mashiach, but also his wife plays an equally important role here, or almost equally important in terms of going, restoring mankind to the Garden of Eden. So Mashiach is for sure married. But, the, but does it mean he has kids? Well, let's see. And in another place in, another place in the Zohar, it talks about the Pasuk. We say in Tehilim, Tzadik Ketamar Ifrach, all right? Tzadik Ketamar Ifrach is referring to Mashiach, and the Zohar says, Matamar lo salik ela dachar venukva, just like a palm tree, they're not going to grow if, unless you have a male and female that pollinate each other, and you need to have a minimum of two palm trees in an orchard so that they give fruit. So just like a palm tree, because we say Tzadik Ketamar Ifrach, the righteous one, the Messiah, will, will flourish like a palm tree, just like a date palm needs both male and female, so too, uf achit tzadik, so too the righteous one, Mashiach, lo salik ela dachar ben nukva, has to have both male and female halves, husband and wife, just like kegavna de Avraham ve Sarah. They will be like Avraham and Sarah. If you remember the Torah says they made souls at kol nefesh asher asu. They were able to inspire people and work together to do mitzvot. So Mashiach and his wife are like a, a, a team, just like Avraham and Sarah, just like Adam and Eve. And how do we know we'll, he will have children? Well, that's implied by the fact that he has to reestablish a Davidic dynasty. Oh, so if you have a dynasty, that implies more than one ruler. And that's what actually the Rambam says very clearly. The Rambam says, Mashiach yamot, he will die. Ve'imloch b'no tachtav, uben b'no. After Mashiach will die, his son will rule, and then his son will rule. So there will be a minimum of three generations in the Messianic age of the Davidic dynasty, because it's supposed to be a dynasty. It's not a dynasty if you only have one, one king. So there has to be a reestablishment of a dynasty. And this is something really amazing, because if you think about it... So, so it means if, if, if the, the king is supposed to last 40 years, then it will be 120 years that's going to go on for... That's right. So if you think about the years, we've said this before, it's 5783, 
so we only have like 200 and some years left. And if the Rambam's telling us we need three kings, and if, if each one rules 40 years, then you, need, you still need to leave time for 120, until the year 6,000, you need to leave like 120 years minimum of, uh, of, of, di- of, di- of a dynasty. The, the, the resurrection. The also, resurrection? by the year 6,000, the resurrection needs to happen. So. But certainly we only have 200 and some years for all this to occur. These three, you know, Mashiach to be the king, then his son, then his son, and there's a, a resurrection of the dead at some point. So there's all this stuff that still needs to happen. So there's really not that much time. But what's really amazing about this is if you note how the five major figures in history that we talked about, Jesus did not have children. Jesus was not even married, did not have children. Shabtai Tzvi had multiple wives, didn't have children. Finally, after he already converted to Islam, he did have a son who he called Ishmael, of course. Oh my God. But that son died after just a few years as a child. And so he never actually had, again, any progeny left over. And again, Lehavdil many, many times, but the Lubavitch Rebbe also did not have children. He had a, a beautiful marriage, for sure, Shlom Bayit. So that's a, a major quality that Mashiach has to have. Yeah. So quality number five, quality number five is that Mashiach is a Baal Teshuvah. So he's somebody that was not born religious, that he becomes religious, this is discussed in, in multiple places. Why is this necessary? Because, and we talked about this before, that when you have a, this, a great soul like that, the sitra achra, the forces of evil, are always going to try to prevent that. It's their job. Like God programmed these forces to kind of prevent and oppose the positive. There's good angels, and there's, there's angels that do good, and there's angels that do not so good, and it's meant to maintain the free will, and God programmed them to do this. And so if there's a possibility for a soul to be Mashiach, then the sitra achra, the forces, the opposing forces are going to do everything possible to make sure that that soul is not born, to keep it from coming into this world. And so as the Arizal explains and many others, that soul has to be covered up in many klipot. The Arizal says the same thing about Avraham. The Arizal talks about how Avraham was born a ben nida. His mother was of course a nida. She, she conceived him in a state of menstrual impurity and uh, for obvious reasons, because Avram was the first Jew, so how could he not be? He was by, by default a Ben Nida, but the Arizal says it was necessary to <laughs> allow this soul to enter the world. Why he had to be born? Well, he's the first Jew, so he, they wouldn't have known the laws of mikveh and all that before. Is he a Jew at all? Well, we consider him the first Jew, like the first person that made a covenant with God that was circumcised and that began the, the Torah tradition. So the, the Arizal talks about how even Avram had to be a Ben Nida on purpose to, because that soul had to be covered up in a lot of klipot to kind of cover its light to allow it to enter this world. And the, the, the idea with Mashiach is very similar. That Mashiach is born in a not so holy spiritual environment. And you know the whole lineage of Mashiach. This is very famous. Our sages point this out all the time. The whole lineage of Mashiach is full of strange relationships. Lot and his daughter produced Moab, who's then the, the great-grandfather, I guess, of Ruth. And Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David. And she's a convert. And she's a convert. And Yehuda and Tamar. And there's all these weird relationships with David and Bathsheba. So in the whole lineage of Mashiach, there's all kinds of seemingly sins involved and it's done on purpose to cover up the soul of Mashiach in a lot of klipot so that his soul will not be prevented from entering this world. So the Midrash famously says, Midrash Rabbah on Bamidbar, Bamidbar Rabbah says that there's four people that don't have a Rebbe, that didn't have a Rabbi, that found God on their own. That four people were able to find God on their own. The first is Avraham. No, no, Moshe. So Eov, Avraham was one. Eov was one, Job. And that's another enigmatic figure that we have to discuss. Who exactly was Job and who, what's his story? We will do that in the future. So Avraham was first, obviously, and then Eov, and the third was Chizkiyahu, like we said, Melech Chizkiyahu, who God wanted to make Mashiach. He didn't have a rabbi. He didn't have no, a... because if you read the Tanakh, uh, where was he born? His father, King Ahaz. No, Ahaz was one of the most wicked kings of Yehuda. He was a horrible idolater, and he expunged Torah in his generation. He turned, the Tanakh says that he made the temple a place of idolatry. And Chizkiyahu was born in that environment, into that context, in a world where Torah scholars were hunted down. There was no Torah. It was all idolatry. The temple was idolatrous. And Chizkiyahu came to God himself. 
And when he became king, he cleaned up the country, reestablished the Torah schools, and did all this great stuff to restore Torah to the land. And so Chizkiyahu, like we said, was one of the potential messiahs. And he was one of these people who was a Baal Tshuva and found God on his own. And he was supposed to be Mashiach as well. And so we had Avraham found God on his own. Iyo found God on his own. Chizkiyahu found God on his own. And the last one, Umelech HaMashiach Me'atzmo, is also will himself come to God. He's not somebody that has a Rebbe. He finds God uh, by himself. So he's born into an unholy, into a, let's say, atheistic environment. Secular. Into a secular environment and comes to God on his own. So those are the five qualities that Mashiach must have. So the scholar part, the warrior part, the musician part, the family, and being a Baal Tshuva. The truth is being a Baal Tshuva doesn't, like, even if somebody born in the religious world could be a Baal Tshuva. The truth is that, unfortunately, not every religious household is, is really 100% religious, and there's a lot of wayward households. And, and even if somebody born into a religious family could kind of could go, off the go off the derech and... Right. Exactly, exactly. So the truth is that even doesn't have to be like necessarily somebody was completely secular and became, although that seems to be the implication, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. But those are the five qualities. So somebody like also like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he would not qualify as a Baal Tshuva. He was born into the holiest possible environment. His father was a great Chacham and Gaon. Yeah, he, he come from his father-in-law, of course, was his Rebbe. So to say that the Lubavitcher Rebbe didn't have a Rebbe, of course he did. He had many. He studied with some of the greatest rabbis. He studied with the Rogach over Gaon. And he had the, the greatest teachers, the finest teachers. And he was born in the holiest, finest environment. Anyway, so these are the five qualities. And we'll just conclude... If we were to put some numbers to this, just as a fun little thought exercise, if we were to actually statistically look at how many people actually have these five qualities. Like, if we were to look at the world today, how many people would even qualify? Not even a handful. So let's see. Let's put some numbers. Let's do this real quick. You have about 15 million Jews in the world. We said before that maybe 20% can be described as being religious in some way. Let's say 20%. Let's be a little liberal with our numbers. Let's say it's 20% that are connected to God in some way and are like living a Torah life, Torah Shebikhtav, Torah Shebe'al Peh, as necessary. So out of 15 million, <laughs> out of 15 million, you're down to about 3 million. Right? And if we're going to focus specifically on the man, the woman's, like we said, the woman also plays the role. The wife is just there just as much. But if we're talking about one individual, then you've got to cut that number in half. 20% are religious. That brings you down to 3 million. Let's say out of those, half is male, half is female. You're down to about 1.5 million. We know that Mashiach has to be a direct descendant of King David, which technically disqualifies Kohanim, sorry. And uh, it disqualifies Levim because there cannot be... Dis- Assuming you're a genuine Kohen, then you have a direct descent from Aaron and you're not a direct descendant of King David. So the good thing is that you can serve in the temple when it's rebuilt. It shouldn't be a genuine Kohen or a Levite and also not a convert because somebody who converted, they're not a direct descendant of King David. Also, if their father converted or their grandfather or their great-grandfather, because once you have in the paternal line a convert, then you're no longer a direct descendant of King David. So if we were to put some number on it, if we have one and a half million, you can definitely take out about a, a third. Nah, about a third you can probably take out. Right? If you consider all the Kohanim, the Levim, and converts, people who have a convert in their uh, paternal lineage, the truth is there's some other... Any other tribe too, for that matter. Right. We don't know also who might not be... We're assuming everybody is a Yehudi, is from the tribe of Yehuda, although it's true that there could be many people that are not necessarily from the tribe of Yehuda, uh, it's possible. So let's say you're down to about one million. And then, so you have about a one in a million shot if you're a religious Jew who's not a Kohen Levi or convert, you know, assuming that you're from the tribe of Yehuda, from the, a descendant of King David, you already have a one in a million shot. If you add up, I looked up the statistics of how many people are musicians that are proficient in a musical instrument. I found different numbers. Uh, in terms of how many people have taken music lessons or how many people are whatever, but I, it seems like that about 10% of the population is proficient in at least one instrument. 10%. I don't know if that's too generous or not, but that's the number I found. So that 1 million, if you take 10%, you're down to 100,000. Now, the, the biggest one is really, who is a real Talmid Chacham? Who's a Torah teacher? Mashiach is supposed to be an inspiring Torah teacher who really truly knows Torah Shebechtav and Torah Shebe'al Peh. So how do we figure out how many people know their stuff? 
and can teach it. King Solomon said in Kohelet, King Solomon said, Od nafshi velo matzati, I was, my soul was looking and I didn't find Adam echad me'elef matzati. I only found one real man in a thousand. So the Midrash Rabbah says, what does that mean when King Solomon said, I only found one real man out of a thousand? <laughs> so the, the Midrash Rabbah says, Binog Shabaulam, the way of the world is, Elif Bnei Adam, a thousand people, Nichnasim Lamikra, will start learning Torah, will start learning scripture. Yotzin Mehen, Mea La Mishnah, a hundred will really be able to grasp it and graduate to learn Mishnah, and really, Alacha Mishnah. And then, out of those, Yotzin Mehen, Asara Le Talmud, out of the a hundred that then go to learn Mishnah, only ten will graduate to properly understand Talmud and everything that that implies. Um, and out of those, Yotzemem Echad Lehora, that one will come out to be able to teach. So there's a rule that the Midrash Rabbah says based on King Solomon. What does it mean when King Solomon said, I only found one man in a thousand? It means out of a thousand people who learn Torah, one will actually know what they're talking about, will end up graduating, <laughs> and will know to be able to actually teach Torah and Talmud and all of that, and Mishnah and Kabbalah and whatever. One in a thousand. So, and that's why Hadahu Dichtiv Adam Echad Me'elef Matzati. That's the meaning of I found King Solomon saying I found one in a thousand. So, if you have a hundred thousand potential, and you're only saying that one in a thousand is capable of being a genuine, real Talmud Chacham scholar teacher, then you're only down to a hundred people. Wow. Out of a hundred thousand. So you have maybe a hundred people that are musicians, that are real Torah teachers, that are not Kohanim Levim, that are religious connected to Hashem, strong, maybe a hundred. And then still, yeah, then you still need what you were saying, that they have to be married, that they have to have children, and that they have to have some kind of warrior potential, that they have to be physically, physically strong, not just Yoshev Alim, but also somebody who's both Yoshev Alim and an Ish Sadeh. So how many do you really have, right? Maybe a, a small handful of people that would actually even qualify. So it's not so simple. We said last time that there's maybe 36 hidden tzaddikim in the world. That might be the number. There might be maybe 36 people that have the potential. And it doesn't really matter who it is. We just want that person <laughs> to come. And uh, hopefully we merit to be the generation where the real, the true Mashiach finally shows up. Okay, we'll end there. Thank you. Thank you.